The Chinese Zen, or Chan Master, Qing Yuan Wei Qing, once said, Thirty years before I'd become an experienced Zen monk, I understood that mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. Later, when I reached and held tightly onto my conscious knowledge of that which brings about each and every occasion into existence, I understood that mountains are not mountains and rivers are not rivers. But now, I've obtained the place where each and every substance abides. Accordingly, I understand that mountains are only mountains and rivers are only rivers. The quote is a good example of the seemingly paradoxical and mind-boggling Zen sayings. However, natural to these qualities is a greater risk of misunderstanding. I'd like to explore this saying, which is often used but rarely explained, and hopefully provide an accurate depiction of the layered meaning behind the saying. Before getting into the analysis, I first must speak on the inherent difficulty with discussing Zen in a philosophical context. Many suggest that Zen cannot be spoken about, at least coherently or philosophically. They purport that Zen is some anti-intellectualism, and while there is some truth in such a view, it is fundamentally a misunderstanding. As Masao Abe says, it is clear that Zen is not a philosophy, it is beyond words and intellect and is not, as in the case of philosophy, a study of the processes governing thought and conduct, nor a theory of principles or laws that regulate people and the universe. For the realization of Zen, practice is absolutely necessary. Nevertheless, Zen is neither a mere anti-intellectualism nor a cheap intuitionism, nor is it an encouragement to animal-like spontaneity. Rather, it embraces a profound philosophy. Thus, Zen is neither attached to intellectualism and explanation, nor anti-intellectualism and incoherence, for this profound philosophy pervades the words of the Zen masters. So today, I'd like to explore some of Zen's profound philosophy. Some of you may be familiar with the quote from its mention in the popular works of The Way of Zen by Alan Watts, or The Tao of Physics by Friedhof Capra. However, neither author brought specific analysis to the quote, placing it among a discussion involving numerous Zen stories. In Watts's The Way of Zen, the saying appears at the end of a discussion on what is to be gained by Zen, that being Wu Shi, or nothing special. That is, the perfectly natural and unaffected, in which there is no fuss or business, as Watts writes. In Copper's The Tao of Physics, the saying takes place within the middle of a discussion on the importance of naturalness within Zen, stating that Zen's emphasis on naturalness is the belief in the perfection of our original nature, the realization that the process of enlightenment consists merely in becoming what we already are from the beginning. Clearly, both authors understood the quote to articulate what happens when one studies Zen, as well as the attainment of one's true or original nature in the realization that comes in the third stage of the quote. While both authors certainly offer thoughtful commentary on ideas surrounding the quote, their readings do not prevent the easiest misunderstanding of the quote, an understanding that would undermine all of Zen. Under this view, the first and third stages of the quote do not differ, since both stages appear to echo the idea that mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers, it would not be difficult to see them as identical. This would be to believe that Wei Xin, before he studied Zen, and Wei Xin after he attained Satori, were no different. If this were to be the case, then Wei Xin's years of practice would be rendered useless, since all his enlightenment achieved was to return him to how he was before Zen. Both Watts and Capra can be interpreted in a way that suggests that they support such an understanding. Watts's nothing special and Capra's original nature risk being understood to be Waitzin's experience in the first stage. Instead, with the help of Kyoto school philosopher Masao Abe, I would like to articulate why this is not the case and how an understanding of this story will provide crucial insight 
on the Zen journey and the philosophy that Zen embraces. To do so, I'll utilize the stages that I've already indicated, beginning with the first stage. 30 years before I'd become an experienced Zen monk, I understood that mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. Consistent with those of others, my translation conveys that at this first stage, Weizin was at a point preceding Zen practice, which is to say that his understanding at this point is similar to any common person's understanding. This is the view that mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. Now, at first, this appears to be simple and undeniably true. Mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. However, within a Buddhist understanding, this is the very problem of existence itself. To see this, one needs to know what is truly being said here. Abe points out that here there is both affirmation and differentiation, for the mountains are indeed mountains, but they are also not rivers. This leads to the question of who is doing the affirming and differentiating. Abe suspects that it is none other than the ego self that anyone would answer to this question, I am, I am differentiating, I am affirming. The key to this lies in objectification, not in the common sense of treating other people as objects, but in the sense that these mountains and rivers are seen as objects in contrast to the subject. The subject-object duality, as the action of objectification, is the base of the ego self. As such, they are not understood as mountains in themselves, but in contrast to others. As Abe would say, they are grasped from the outside, not from within. It is crucial to Buddhist philosophy that this stage, based on the ego self, is far from satisfactory, for the very ego self is near the root of all human misery. Abe describes this well when he states, Self-estrangement and anxiety are not something accidental to the ego self, but are inherent to its structure. To be an ego self means to be cut off from both oneself and one's world, and to be cut off from oneself and one's world means to be in constant anxiety. And, examining one's life, one cannot fail to stumble upon either the fear of death which threatens to hurl us into a chasm of meaninglessness, or the mind-assailing guilt which often arises as a condemnation of the impurity of our acts. However, as seen by the fact that it is only the first stage, experience is not limited to just this. For the leap to the second stage begins when one pursues the question, who am I? Here, the questioned, the I, is the object of the question, while the questioner is the subject. The ego self may answer, I am me. However, this does not penetrate to the subjective self, or true self, or the one asking the question. The question becomes a largely existential infinite regress, with the true self at no point being attained. Yet, the leap to the second stage is completed when one existentially realizes that the true self is unattainable. Through an existential realization, not simply an intellectual negation, the ego self is destroyed and replaced by the no-self. One has moved to the second stage. Later, when I reached and held tightly onto my conscious knowledge of that which brings about each and every occasion into existence, I understood that mountains are not mountains and rivers are not rivers. At this stage, Wei Xin is well into Zen practice. He has come to the realization of no self, a stage in which there is no affirmation, no differentiation, no objectification, and no duality of subject and object, as the mountains are not mountains and the rivers are not rivers. To best grasp what exactly this means, one can look to the roots of Zen, particularly the early Mahayana philosopher Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna, author of the Mulamadyamaka Karika, or the fundamental wisdom of the middle way, articulated the philosophy of shunyata, commonly translated as emptiness. Taking the Buddhist concepts of impermanence, codependent origination, and no self to their logical conclusion, Nagarjuna asserted that all things lack svabhava, best understood as essence or inherent existence. Thus, Nagarjuna's shunyata established that all things are incapable of existing on their own, independent, of all other things. But shunyata is not a doctrine nor is it a fundamental hypothesis to bear our beliefs on, but rather the negation of all such doctrines. Returning to the quote, Weizin has moved from a position of affirmation to one of negation, 
and not simply a logical negation, but an existential negation, akin to renunciation. That is, no mountains or rivers, since they lack svabhava, they are empty. Now, for the most part, my translation does not differ from that of Watts or Abe. However, unlike them, I have chosen to translate the character, Shi, not simply as knowledge, but as conscious knowledge. It is not only a means of knowing, but is specifically consciousness as the fifth of the five skandhas. The five skandhas being a Buddhist concept that comprises the five aggregates of clinging. Applying the earlier view of emptiness, these five skandhas are in reality empty of inherent existence. However, within the quote there is the mention of a tight grasp onto this conscious knowledge, implying that, at this point, Weizin has not transcended his discriminating function. This is to say that he, at this point, may have released the other four aggregates of clinging, but still holds on to that of his consciousness, thus not yet having attained Satori. I had said earlier that in this stage, there is no differentiation, since the stage is the very negation of differentiation. However, within this negation is an implicit differentiation between differentiation and non-differentiation. It is an objectification and conceptualization of the negative, rather than the affirmative that marks the stage. Thus, there is an attachment to emptiness as a concept, an attachment to non-attachment. To end one's journey here would be to fall into nihilism. One must negate negation, empty emptiness, to transcend objectification and conceptualization. Doing so requires another leap of existential realization. The last leap, from the first stage to the second stage, required one to wholly understand that the true self is unattainable. But this leap requires one to wholly understand that the unattainable itself is the true self. To give up attachment to non-attachment. In explanation, Abe writes, When we come to the realization that the unattainable itself is the true self, neither the true self nor the unattainable are conceived objectively in even the slightest degree. Because in this realization, the unattainable itself is realized as I, as the true self. In other words, it is not that I am empty, but rather that emptiness is I. Through overcoming the negative view, I am empty, emptiness is subjectively and existentially realized as I, as the true self. Hence there is no gap between this realization and I. The realized is the realizer, and the realizer is the realized. Following this realization, one comes to the third stage. But now, I have obtained the place where each and every substance abides. Accordingly, I understand that mountains are only mountains, and rivers are only rivers. At this stage, Weizhen has attained Satori. He has taken the second leap, realizing that the unattainable itself is the true self. He has done so through the renunciation of the second stage. There has now been a negation of the no-self, which was the negation of the ego-self. Given a better label, this breaking through of both no-self and ego-self is the great death, the great negation, or, as is the case with negating the negated, the great affirmation. Mountains are no longer not mountains, and rivers are no longer not rivers. For mountains are only mountains, and rivers are only rivers. The mountains are truly mountains, and not rivers. However, this is the crucial point at which one must avoid the common misunderstanding. There is once again, as there was in the first stage, both affirmation and differentiation. However, unlike the first stage, the basis for affirmation and differentiation is no longer objectification and the ego-self, for these were left in the first leap, as was the conceptualization of the second stage in the second leap. All objectification and conceptualization, positive and negative, as well as all other dualities, have been completely overcome. Emptiness has thus emptied itself out, for great emptiness or great fullness. And thus, mountains are really mountains in themselves. That is, everything in the world is real in itself. And yet, on the other hand, everything is equal, interchangeable, and interfusing. The mountains are finally grasped from within, and not from outside. This is not an everyday understanding, but the understanding of Satori. As a result of this reading, 
My translation differs slightly from those of Watts and Capra. Watts translates the character, Ji, as once again. The character, and three other interchangeable characters during the Tang Dynasty, often meant merely, only, or still. To translate it as again is to risk rendering the third stage identical to the first. Instead, my translation uses only, which is to show that, unlike the affirmation of the first stage, the third stage is that of great affirmation. Through this reading, when Copper writes on the perfection of our original nature, what is meant by original nature is not our being in the first stage, but instead original nature as our true self, ourselves as only ourselves, and yet equal and interchangeable. While the ego self of the first stage led one into suffering, and the no self of the second stage led one into nihilism, the true self of the third stage finds no troubles. Farabe writes, Herein all forms of anxiety and all forms of attachment, open and hidden, explicit and implicit, are completely overcome, and self-estrangement and anxiety are fundamentally overcome because the unattainable is no longer realized as something negative or nihilistic. Rather, it is realized positively as the true self. Using hunger as an example, which can often bring anxieties of what to eat, along with attachments to foods impacts on our bodies, hunger no longer brings difficulties, for when you are hungry, there is nothing behind being hungry. You are just hungry, no more, no less. When you eat, there is nothing beyond eating. Eating is the absolute action at that moment. Like this, all actions conducted in the third stage are absolute actions at that moment. This is the understanding of the third stage. Abe's translation is rather similar to the one I provided from the Way of Zen. However, it adds the question, do you think these three understandings are the same or different? Using the earlier analysis, the first and second stage are blatantly at odds. The ego self of the first stage is not compliant with the understanding of the third stage, and the same can be said of the no-self of the second stage. However, Abe holds that the third stage embraces the other two, stating that the third stage is not a static end to be reached progressively from the lower stages, but the dynamic whole, which includes both great negation and great affirmation, a dynamic whole in which you and I are embraced and which excludes nothing. From the third understanding, neither the first nor the third are excluded, and at this understanding or stage, it is not to be conceptualized as something temporal, since the realization of everything being really just as it is, the realization which takes place in the absolute present, is not merely the final stage or the end of an objective approach in time, but being beyond time is the ground or original basis on which the objective approach can be properly established and from which the temporal sequence can legitimately begin. Finally, from this point, Abe offers his answer to the question of the stages, stating, They are different and yet not different. They are the same and yet different at once. Now, that's all I have to talk about for today. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like and subscribe. If you have any comments or disagreements, leave them down below, and until next time.